Hello and welcome to This Hour is Five Decades. I'm Carol McNeil. The names Howard Kalin and Mark Volman probably don't ring a bell with you. But how about Flo and Eddie? These two singer-songwriters used to have a regular gig on Peter Zosky's show 90 Minutes Live way back in the rollicking 70s. They interviewed musicians like Shaka Khan, David Cassidy, David Bowie, and Tom Waits. Their unique insight and presence probably stemmed from the fact that Flo and Eddie were musicians in their own right. They were members of the band The Turtles. Now you must know this song. Okay, here we go. Are we to sing? Yes. There's nothing wrong with it. We're just, it's the sound. Looking for the magic. <laughs> you mean you guys are messing up and I'm not? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, you know, <laughs> studio error. Oh, no, never. But not in this case. We've got a, a mic. We're going to switch over mics, okay? Hang Relax on. a second, and we're going to try a new mic on you. What should I do about my voice? Should I gargle? We'll, we'll try and save that quality for, you know, in here. <laughs> okay. We can alter it in there. Let me hear some delay, it really is obvious. Imagine me and you, I do. I think about you day and night. It's only right to think about the girl you love and hold her tight, so happy together. Because I should call you up. Invest a dime, and you should say you both like me. Both like and he's a small phrasing problem. Small phrasing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Okay, the, the first part, you know, was not, you know, really in the right key. <laughs> if that's a problem to you, I was not in the right key. Yeah. The, the, I was in the wrong key. Just a little bit. I'm afraid so. Oh. Okay, so we're just gonna try it from the top. I need that. <laughs> yeah. Have okay. to think higher pitched. Think okay. higher pitched. Give it to me again. Let me hear it one more time. You got the helium? <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. Uh -oh. This is no laughing matter. I'm not laughing. Good luck. You don't want to hear it. Let's do it again. <laughs> Imagine me and you. I do. I think about you day and night It's only right to think about the girl you love And hold her tight, so happy together <laughs> oh, no. If I should call you up Eat your heart out of you <laughs> And you say you belong to me And ease my mind Imagine how the world could be So very fine, so happy together <laughs> Get ready, ready? Here it is. I can't see me loving nobody. That's me? That's, That's you. you. This is what you sound like. What do you think? Looks to me like we're going to have an album. What do you think? Ready, though. If you heard this guy on your show, would you pick him again? No. No way. No way. Me and you. And you and me. Don't you think it's sort of new wave? <laughs> it had to no. be. The new only one maybe. for me is you. And you for me. This ending's so the happy. book. The hook is the thing they keep coming back to. Happy together. <laughs> How is the weather? <laughs> Happy together.
Flo. And I'm Eddie. And we're here again uh, in Hollywood, and we want to say hello to you all. From the Tropicana Hotel, some would say one of the schleziest places in Hollywood. To, to live or stay at for even one night. It's $12 a night. The pool has little things I swimming in it. I can smell the onions at Duke's Cafe next door. However, but what we have in waiting for us is one of the most interesting and uh, unusual interviews I think you'll find anywhere. An eccentric pop singer who I, I think you'll get a rare insight to in this very privileged interview. He uh, earns millions of dollars and yet chooses to live in this... Uh, well, why don't we show him Why don't we just show you? Live. We're one going back is worth, to you know. uh, interview Tom Waits now. And now we're going to take you and show you Tom, Tom Waits. Waits. He's got to be here. The car's here. That's not going anywhere. He's home. Sounds like he's home. He is listening to something here. <laughs> His car is certainly dead. He's here. Bill collectors. The Jet Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, Hi, Flo and Eddie. Oh, All right. Hold it right there. <laughs> he must have thought we were the Bee Gees. <laughs> we're okay. I'm clean, oh, Joe. Clean. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Hey. Nice place. Oh. Don't make no bad moves. I see you've let the servants go for the weekend. <laughs> I don't live this way. Cause because, I mean, I'm just basically cheap. <laughs> do you hate leaving this place when you go out on the tour? I mean, do you feel like I'm leaving home and I'm... Ah, I enjoy returning. You know? I've been, I just got back from Japan uh, a couple of days ago. So, uh, How so does it go over there for you? Well, they, frankly, they went berserk. I mean, um, I was there a year ago. It's kind of like playing in Iowa a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, Shorter don't, Iowa. They don't speak English. You know. so, <laughs> it takes a while, and, and, but I found it. It was it was good for for me as an entertainer because I would I'd do more pantomime on stage. Uh, anything to get them to to, to laugh, or, or you, know, you, have, you have to meet them more than halfway because of the language problem. So. I come on stage with like a broken umbrella or anything to, you know, to, to help them uh, uh, help them understand what I'm trying to tell them. Mm -hmm. you know? And they do get it. I mean, they get it. I they mean, get they get it here. You know? Yeah, you're you're a swinging bachelor type, right? You hit the road as well, a look swing. around you. <laughs> I see this atmosphere now. <laughs> now, in Japan, now certainly you must meet these gorgeous Oriental ladies that are willing to spend an evening with this mysterious visitor from the West. Right? Or do they all want to sit in your room and watch television? <laughs> very timid over there. Really? Yeah, they don't make the first move. Very shy and uh, very very gentle people. What's a girl in Hollywood then? I mean, what's she like? Oh, you know, they, they cross their sevens and say chow. They go to Palm Springs. They drive Porsches with tennis rackets in the back seat. You know? Whether they, they play or they not. They proxide their mustaches and shit. You, know? you can't handle that? I know. You live in it. I mean, you come here to live in the midst of this glamour. Yeah. Well, I feel more like an inmate here, actually. <laughs> Hey, you're doing a uh, film score, right? For, um... Not a score, but a couple of songs. A couple of songs for Paradise Alley. Paradise Alley, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what is that exactly? It's a story about three Italian brothers in the Hell's Kitchen in New York in the late 40s. It's, it's a beautiful story. It's kind of a, uh, it's a Stallone's a, a, a fantasy about what could have happened. I mean, and, uh, it's about three brothers who are struggling to get out of the Hell's Kitchen and want to move to Miami. Was I play a drunk piano player? How did they ever figure that one out? Oh, nothing to it. <laughs> so you're writing a couple of songs that are actually going to act in the film? Yeah, I was kind of walking on eggshells. I'm already done. Oh, it's, it's whole, in the can. Whole new world for me. I think I'd be all right. I could see you in films. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Can you see yourself going into that sort of direction as a? I don't know how much uh, uh, leading man. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I can see that. There's a little Richard Dreyfus in there. <laughs> there could be. Oh, you know, Richard. <laughs> Behind the 
ride the tide over there. I, think. I don't really know if I'm what the woman of today wants and, and needs. I think you're in. <laughs> what if that's true, though? I mean, think about that. What if we've created a world where you're the guy the woman of today wants? <laughs> well, I don't have that. No, I was going to say. I have visitors here at night. You really find out who your friends are, don't you? Oh, yeah, I do all right. chords i mean it's all trite how do you write stuff i really hate it uh, but you're at the piano i feel so much like i'm in with hoagie carmichael yeah i mean how do you, you know, sit down and write Recording-wise, she's Maybe, great. Yeah, you you guys it. work great together. I'd like to. Uh, we were on stage once uh, at the Troubadour. We did a thing on stage. And I wrote that tune called I Never Talk to Strangers. And we did as a, a duet with a kind of a baby, it's cold outside yeah. sort of flavor that I really like. Yeah, that was great. That was so, a great piece you did. I think that. maybe we'll, uh, we may do something in the future. Uh, uh, she's doing a film right now. So I, You're one of the few artists uh, in the commercial field that I've ever heard of that went uh, two track directly to the tape or to oh, yeah. disc, right? Right to disc, without any of that. Well, not to the disc, but we cut, we, we cut the whole thing live two track in the studio. It's like, a, so there's that no multi-track, no overdubbing at all. So I get a, a performance in the studio. With an orchestra and the whole thing. Yeah, I stood in the studio uh, for the last album in the middle of the studio with like uh, 52, uh, Musicians, you know, it's very exciting. How wonderful! Know. It's like Sinatra. I mean, you <laughs> there it is. He want the concert way. He did it his way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great! How I the magic of film. <laughs> Foster Freeze there, somewhere, somewhere back in the Nebraska of my mind. It's a Saturday night, and traffic rolls by. And that's a moment, 
Cali apple, red, Mustang with a busted convertible on top. And there's a liquid tattoo. Turn the gunmetal blue. Scrolled across the shoulders of a dying town. Took the one-eyed jacks across the railroad tracks. The scar on his belly pulled a stranger passing through. He's just a juvenile delinquent. He never learned how to behave. Oh, but the cops never think to look. Out in burn. like Farley Granger. He had his hair slicked back. She said, I'm a sucker for a fellow who wears a cowboy hat. She said, how far are you going? He said, baby, that depends on what you mean. Honey, I'm only stopping here to get me some gasoline. He said, I guess I'm going that way just as long as I guess you'd say I'm on my way. That's a part of shame. And so with her knees up on the glove compartment, she took out her barrettes. And her hair spilled out like a root beer, and she popped her gum and arched her back. She said, hey, man, Marysville don't amount to nothing a wide spot in the road. Some nights my heart pounds like thunder. I don't know why I don't explode. Don't you see everyone in this stinking town? It's got one foot in the grave. And I'd rather take my chances out in Barbershane. He said, baby, Presley's what I go by. Why don't you change the station, count the grain elevators in the rearview mirror? She said, Miss, anywhere you point this thing, it's got to beat the hell out of the sting of going to bed with every dream that's going to die here every morning. So drill me a hole with a barber pole. I won't be jumping my parole just like a fugitive tonight. Why don't you have another swig? Pass that car if you're so brave. I gotta get there before the sun comes up. Boy, I'm ashamed. And the spider web crack and the Mustang scream. The smoke from the tires and the twisted machine. Just a nickel's worth of dreams. Just about every wishbone that they saved lies swindled from them on the way to burn shave. And the sun hit the derrick and cast a bat wing shadow. Up against the corridor on the shotgun side. And as they pulled her out from the wreck, you know, she still had on her shades. They say the dreams are growing wild. Just this side of her shade. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.
Good night. Good night. The world famous Continental Hyatt House Hotel in Hollywood. This is the, the place where all the rock bands come and stay. Can you feel that rock band vibe? Led Zeppelin comes, takes out two floors here, trashes it, ruins it, pays in advance. Everyone loves it. Hundred thousand throws TVs out the windows into the pool. We've got an exciting guest with us today. Upstairs, by the pool, up on the roof, because he's such a nice a man. guy. Right, is a man who has written all of the lyrics for so all of rich. the Elton John records. He's so rich. Do you know how rich he is? Did you see what he drove in in? That black rolls that thing? That black rolls. Oh, Unbelievable. Man. Why don't you get in our back pockets, we'll get in the elevator, go upstairs, and interview Bernie, Bernie Toppin. Toppin. Huh? Come on. Here we go. Huh? <laughs> I don't have a back pocket. The thing is, though, I think in our relationship, as far as Elton and I's writing is concerned, is that I've never felt pushed into the background. I mean, I've always, I've always had as much recognition um, as I feel, not that I've deserved, but that uh, I've needed. I've never felt that, you know, I've been pushed into the background. So you never I've... aspired to be that guy up on stage doing that? No, because the majority of what he's doing on stage, he's just saying, you know, I'm putting words into his mouth in a way. Uh, so I, I've never, you know, I've, I've always been quite happy to stand at the side and see him. It's, it's. Can I, can I ask? It's like having a dummy. Did you, did you always prepare uh, the lyrics before the music, or was yeah. there sometimes um, the well, other it's, way? It's changed just lately, but in, in the last, uh, from the time we started writing, like in '67, up to last year, it was always that I would write the lyrics first, and then I'd just give them to him and uh, he would go away and work on the melody. And I mean, that's, that's the way it's always been until the last few, the last album, the last couple of singles. I mean, like, Don't Go Breaking My Heart, we, <coughs> excuse me, we wrote in the studio. Literally? Yeah, we didn't have any words. That's he just had great. the melody, and um, they did the complete track before they even had the words. And I just went in there, and I had to do them in five minutes, you know, before they came in. So I just wrote the words down, you know. Does that give you kind and of a laugh the, when you put the, the platinum <coughs> record up on the wall going, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's why the lyrics to that are so inane, you know, because it took me five minutes. And, uh, hey, I can be inane in less than that. <laughs> it took me ten minutes with the, all the others, and that's why they're inane, too. What, what eventually ca caused, in your mind, the, uh, the, let's say, I don't want to say dissolvement of your writing as a team, but at this point, you're not writing together. It all stems from me making a move to California and wanting to become an American resident. So geographically, you know. you're so far apart. They yeah, and also, you see, you have to remember as well that Elton is still very loyal to Great Britain and Monterey. prefers to stay there because of his football team. And, I mean, that's his main passion, you know. And uh, we... It's, it's, it's hard for us to communicate now. I mean, we're not good on the phone with each other. And... Um, so he doesn't, and he doesn't really want to come here, and I can't leave the country because I'm, to become a resident here, I have to stay here for a mm -hmm. certain amount. I mean, that, that all political, boring, right. sh you know, etc. Yeah, who wants to talk about it? But I nearly said something. Yeah, <laughs> really. This is Canadian television, I forgot. Um, and so, due to that, uh, the writing has gone f like that, you know, and uh, so he... He's had, uh, he's had to put product out, and I mean, he wants to work. And we have a number of songs that we wrote when he was here last. You know, I mean, he comes here occasionally, and we write when he comes here. And we've written about five or six songs. Um, so he's, had, uh, he's been trying to write on his own, trying to work, you know, which is good, you see. I mean, it'd probably work out for the better. He'll have the experience of trying to write songs on his own. What are you working on right now? As you guys know, I'm... Probably my closest friend is Alice Cooper, and uh, I've known Alice for like, I guess, oh, 10 years now. And uh, we met in a radio station when we were both starting out in like 1970. He was taking off, you know, to stardom, and we were doing the same. And uh, uh, so we struck up a friendship then, and um, from then on, I mean, we've been talking about doing something for years. And uh, we never got round to doing it. I mean, and now Alice is feeling a lot better for certain reasons. <laughs> yes. That I'm sure the media knows about. Um, he's, I mean, he's a 
really ready to do something good now. And he's I an think incredible person. Must he's be the he's word, probably the incredible. nicest person in rock and roll. And yeah. I, you know, I don't, I, I say that, you know, without even having to think about mm -hmm. it. It really is a. Everybody in rock and roll has got so much ego, and you have to have an ego in rock and roll to survive. And he's one of the few people that has no ego and has survived, you know. Yes. He's still Vinny. And I think, yeah, he's still Vinny, you know, old Vinny. Now, he's a lyricist as well. He's a lyricist as well, and I mean, it's, it's a very That's odd combination of two lyricists to work together, but it's been real easy, and I've tried to work with other lyricists occasionally, and I mean, I don't like to do that, because I figure, why am I working with this guy when I can do it just as well on my own? I don't need it, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yet... I can remember coming out of a, a basement rehearsal that Alice did and just passing by the music stand where scrawled were the lyrics to Only Women Bleed yeah. without a melody yet. And we both looked at them and went, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, that was, you could tell. consummate composer, performer, some would say, of the world these days, Mr. David Boy. Hi, David. Can we applaud? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I've always wanted to ask, was that a period that there was a lot of people who really tried to put David Bowie in the Ziggy years in with the Alice Cooper thing? Because yeah, isn't of isn't that uh, absurd? Well, it was because of I the... I think it was inevitable. I don't know. It's not absurd. I well, mean, we both were doing... Broad category. Well, but people tend to do things, the, things like that. Yes, they? they do have a tendency. I kind of expected all that to you know, happen. Um, and I just trusted in my own um, conceptions that eventually we'd split off and have separate identities, Alice and myself. You know. Worked out okay. Yeah, I mean, just trusted in my own optimistic ideas of what I could do. Are you these days that optimist as well? Do you see that much? Uh, Optimism in rock and roll, that was a very optimistic record for rock. I mean, yeah. This guy well, saving rock, literally. I'm pretty self-satisfied with my own um, individuality. I don't think I have to exert myself so much to um, uh, explain that I'm not part of rock and roll. I have my own identity. I'm not, I just use rock and roll. And I had to be very exaggerated in the beginning to um, defy people to put me into a category so that that would leave me room to work in. What is Ziggy? Ziggy, Ziggy I, wanted, I wanted to define the archetype uh, Messiah rock star. That's all I wanted to do. And I used the trappings of Kabuki theater, mime technique, um, fringe New York music, like uh, my references were Velvet Underground, right. whatever. Suffragette City or... Uh, it had that, that, the that energy value. The I wanted street. that energy value, yeah. It was Even a the cover British the view yeah. of American en street energy. So Ziggy was, for me, a very simplistic thing. It was what it seemed to be, an alien rock star. And uh, for performance value, I dressed him and acted him out. I left it at that. Other people reread him and contributed more information about Ziggy than I had put into him. Right, they could write it, novels about that guy. Right, right, I think basically because of the uh, that I'd put three viewpoints into the album um, from uh, three different areas. Maybe the the character himself would appear, and then there would be two other statements by two other people, all on one album, which was kind of confusing. Oh, but it was, I mean, it was, it was uh, the way an author would write a book. Yes. Rather, I mean, it hadn't been utilized that much in, in, in records. And I Forever. had trouble they, explaining they that they it was just, it was a there. theater piece that the spiders didn't really exist, that they only existed for the length, the duration of that character's life. Right. I was stuck with him for a long time. It took a long time to shake him off after I'd finished working with him because people would relate to him more than David Bowie at the time. Yeah. It was still very hard for anybody to realize that a rock artist can go on stage and be a different People's person still, every time he goes on stage. They so do that nobody was doing that. Day, though. It need not be repetitive, right? Exactly. You don't have to be the same personality every time you go on stage. And uh, mine was more exaggerated. Yeah. There are no characters really involved with the, the last two projects other than David Bowie, I, I with, see. With Low and Heroes. Yeah. Yes. No, of course not. I'm, uh, because when I got back to Europe, before I could start getting involved with characters or narrative again, 
I had to define a new form of musical language. And, and at this I point, Germany was really a part of you at this time. I mean, you No, that happened when I left America. As I was leaving America, I knew I had to get to an environment that was totally different to Los Angeles. So I thought of the most uh, arduous city that I could think of, and it was West Berlin. <laughs> and so I stuck myself. You picked in up everything and just sort of took a flat. I left everything. And left and just went there. Yeah, and I left Bel Air and uh -huh. I left all my <laughs> millions of videos. And then moving out of that to an area where I actually had to go down the road and buy food in a shop, actually learn how to buy a plane ticket, which mm -hmm. sounds so sort of, you know, naive and trite. It but most like people, you, because they can do those things... Sounds like you dumped a lot of people along the way then. That you yes, I did. Do that for you. I did. I reduced this whole incredible entourage that was sort of starting to develop down to three or four people that I work very well with. Um, is, is that sort of how you live now, with that sort of hub of people? Yeah, well, I've... I've, I've uh, my womb of Berlin, when it was a womb because of the wall, I guess it was all psychological to go there. I mean, I needed some kind Protection of womb. Of that There's fortress. a tension there, too. The tension there is terrific, and it, it, it forced me to reevaluate my position in any given society. <coughs> that, in you between know, Low and Heroes, even, you took Iggy Pop to Berlin mm. to, to make his record. I think, I, and, uh, yes, I, I think it's a very good therapeutic city for an artist to go to. I, I, so I wanted to come back to. Not the uh, punk street level, but a real street level, oh, where yeah. you have to go and do things for yourself, well, where nobody will up. take any notice of you. I was totally anonymous in Berlin. But you they couldn't that. care less. You enough. seem to do that. I mean, after every album, after every tour or project, you take these bizarre trips and you go but away how? Places. I mean, who wants to come to a city and have people come up to you and say, you know, what's happening on Mars at the moment? Oh, I mean, yeah. you know, it's yeah. you've got to. <laughs> Very unlikely that would happen in Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tell us sure. about Kenya. Kenya? Yeah. What do you want to know about Kenya? Are you going to record there back? next? To... Okay, well, um, I don't know. I, 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 I didn't know what to expect from Kenya before I got there. I mean, I went there to show my son how animals really live, um, that they're not always behind bars, because he's seen the Berlin Zoo, and, and things like that, and that's about it. I mean, he's only six, and he hadn't, he's only seen them in, in zoos, and so he got there, and, and we started looking at the animals, and then I found it was a real country with real people in. It wasn't just one great big safari, and there were kinds of people that I'd never come across before, people called tribes, who led existences that they've led for 700, 800 years. Unchanged. Unchanged. Yeah. And also very quite another quite humbling experience. I completely. I mean, it's totally humiliating. I've never met such proud and tall people. <laughs> I can't say. I wish we had more time to just stand here and sit here and talk, really. It, it, stand I mean, we, we oh. will sit here and talk for <laughs> more hours, but uh, we have to really kind of buzz off. And that's really... That's a Canadian me. word for... Buzz. Station break. Buzz off. Yeah, yes. you, you've uh, oh, joined. Yes. Uh, we'll say goodbye. Like right you. Now. This is been our <laughs> and Howard, Flo, and Eddie, and David Bowie, and I. You know, Howard you, and I. We it's been my very great pleasure. pleasure. Really, and we will do it again. I promise. And I right. promise as well. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. And ever anxious as we are to promote the cause of national, yea, international insanity, I welcome now our regular Friday night lunatics, our conduits into the worlds of rock and roll music, and they have a very special guest, so I'll turn it right over to them, Flo and Eddie. Hello! I'm Flo. I'm, I'm Eddie. Eddie. And by way of introduction, this I'm is our... I'm Chaka. Yes, our good friend, this is Chaka Khan. Chaka Khan. All right. Now, <laughs> for those people who are just out of it, who don't know who Chaka is... She had a big hit record with the group uh, called Rufus that went, Tell me something good. Yow me, yow me, yow me, yow me. Right? Is yeah. that right? That was in, what, 1972. Two. Yeah. The giant hit record that uh, crossed over R and B yeah. and and pop and everything, yeah. right? A giant group, and uh, out of Chicago. Yeah, based out of Chicago. 
Yeah. Is this your first time in Calgary? Yes, it is, and I really like it. How is huh? it? Where is it? It's a hot city, man. A hot city. You didn't <laughs> yeah. wear your Calgary ski boots, though, I noticed. No, I didn't. I left You bought some boots. When, uh, when Rufus changed from Rufus featuring Chaka Khan, Howard and I have always wanted to know, was there like a, a problem with the male members and how they reacted to you becoming like the leader? Out. I mean, you were... It was Rufus featuring Chaka Khan, right? Well, yeah. Well, they didn't have... They don't have me anymore, really, like they had me, you know? And I, you mean I was possessively? Like, yeah, really. I'm like, I was like their little sister, and uh -huh. they were like my fathers, and stuff like that. It was really a weird relationship we had. You know, it wasn't like... How about uh, when, you, when you dated people on the road? Oh, that, that just was terrible. They used to give <laughs> fellas just... Trouble. Terrible times. What kind of stuff? Well, like, you know, if I were playing Chicago or something, which is my hometown... <laughs> uh, no applause here for Chicago. Uh, <laughs> that is a western city. Though. Western <laughs> city, folks. Hey, let's hear it for the west. Okay. You know, I'd have a, a dressing room after a show full of friends. And if it weren't one of them, two of them would, would march in and say, All right, clear the room. <laughs> <laughs> How about singing? Hey, singing uh, a song. Oh, I'd love These that are great would help boots, huh? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Chaka Khan, huh? Chaka Khan. Goodbye, no more leading with our chins, this is where our story is, never lovers, ever friends, goodbye. From the Partridge family, our special guest tonight, David Cassidy, one of our very special guests, and our regulars, Flo and Eddie, together again for the first time. David Cassidy with Flo and Eddie.
Join us next time when we open up the vaults for another look at 50 years of CBC television.